All right, we're going to continue in our What Jesus Said series. And what we're doing is we're going into the Gospels and we're seeing phrases that Jesus repeats over and over again and seeing the significance of why he used these particular uh, phrases. Last week we uh, looked into the phrase of... My mind just went blank. (laughs) Does anybody remember what it was? (laughs) Truly, truly, I say to you, (laughs) thank you over there. All right, awesome. Uh, yeah, I started saying that. I was like, I have no idea what I'm about to say. <laughs> Anybody ever do that before? You just start talking and you just hope you find the way along the way. There. Anyway, and so uh, this week uh, I want to talk to you about the kingdom of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is one of the major topics of the gospel. Uh, you know, we see John the Baptist coming out saying, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, that was Jesus' message. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. And and we see this a lot in Jesus' teaching where he talks about the kingdom of God. Has anybody ever wondered what actually is the kingdom of God besides me? Anybody ever had that thought? It's like, what exactly is it? Um, you know, because we don't really see like just a definite. I like definitions. Like, Jesus just define it for me at some point, you know. And, and so as we look through the Gospels, he does define it little by little. Uh, and in fact... The word kingdom in the Gospels is mentioned 114 times. Um, That's not always referring to the kingdom of God. When we look at the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, which, by the way, those two things are the same. Uh, Matthew chose to say kingdom of heaven, where most others said kingdom of God. Uh, It's mentioned 81 times, just talking about the kingdom of God. And so there's a lot in the Gospels about the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God? What is it? Um, I'm going to give you a very uh, a, a definition that's definitely not going to cover all of it, uh, but it kind of gives us a general idea of what it is uh, at the beginning. It says, it, it's God's rule and reign over heaven and earth. All right, It's the reality where God's will is done. It's marked by righteousness, peace, love, and justice. Uh, and, and so what, what we're looking at when we look at the kingdom of God is... Uh, as we see throughout the New Testament, when they started talking about kingdoms, they were thinking about government, and they were thinking about you know, people, you know, physical uh, kingdoms that people had back in those times, like there's a king, and there's a parliament, and there's all of this stuff, and, and that's what was in a lot of people's minds when it came to the kingdoms, and so when Jesus came and started talking about the kingdom of God, it kind of threw people off a little bit, because they thought he was going to come and set up, come and take over Israel, and, and rule Israel, but that was not... Jesus' purpose. In fact, we can see all the way back at the beginning, you know, when Jesus was born, you know, the wise men came in and they talked to King Herod. What was King Herod's reaction to that? What do you mean there's another king? And he said, I'm going to eliminate this person that thinks that they're going to be king next. And so in their minds, when they were talking about the kingdom, they were thinking physical kingdom. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. It's the similar thing as where Jesus, where God rules and reigns, but it's something that's not connected directly to earth necessarily. Because he rules and reigns in heaven, right? Okay. He does. He rules and reigns in heaven. <laughs> y'all going y'all to get with me today, aren't you? He rules and reigns in heaven. And so when Jesus came to earth, he was establishing his rule and reign on earth as well. You know, we see things like even in the Lord's Prayer, and we're going to get to that here in a second. It says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, and, and so what, it, what we see when, in, when they were preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that was the Messiah was about to show up, and the kingdom of heaven was about to be in the earth as well. And so that's kind of a very loose definition of what the kingdom of God is. But as we get into it, I, I'm hoping to uh, help that get a little bit tighter in your mind. And so what is the message of the kingdom? What is the message of the kingdom? As we look into the kingdom, we see that when Jesus was coming, he said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is, is here now. And, and they talked about the message of the kingdom a lot of the times. When, when we look into the gospels, we call it the, the four gospels, but we never actually see the word gospel in the gospels. They call it the message of the kingdom. So what was the message of the kingdom? Uh, The message of the kingdom has to do with the Messiah coming, right? And he was going to give his life. We enter the kingdom of God by recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and that he's the Lord of our life. All right? We surrender our will 
to his will and to his purpose. All right, so the message of the kingdom is that the Messiah is coming and that we need to give our lives to him. We need to sell out to God in this. And so, and the whole message of the kingdom is about what Jesus was going to do while he was here, here on earth. He wasn't coming to set up a physical kingdom, but he was coming to eradicate sin. He was coming to, to lay his life down so that sin could be paid for, that death could uh, would be paid for, and, and those things, and that we can have relationship with God again. And this is the message of the kingdom. So in order to fully experience the kingdom of God, it requires faith, and it requires obedience. All right? Faith and obedience. I'm not saying that we earn our way into heaven with our obedience. What I'm saying is if we want to experience the fullness of what the kingdom has to offer then it requires our obedience to be a part of the kingdom of God. See, we enter the kingdom of God through faith. It's by grace through faith that we are saved, all right? It's not any of our works, but it's a gift of God. And so that's how we enter into the kingdom of heaven. But if we want to experience the fullness of what God has for us, it requires us to submit our will to His will and be obedient to Him. Does that make sense? All right, very good. And so... uh, I want to dive into some scripture and look at some characteristics of the kingdom. Uh, And and then I want to get into uh, some of the teachings of Jesus about the kingdom of God. In fact, he talked about it a lot, but there's one chapter in Matthew that he gave eight parables speaking directly about what the kingdom of God is like. And, And that's what we're talking about today is the kingdom of God is life. That is the phrase that we're looking at. Today, but, but before we dive into those parables, I want to look at some characteristics of the kingdom of God according to the scripture. So if we look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Jesus is talking here. He says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you. What is he talking about here? Uh, we can back up into Matthew chapter 6, and uh, you know he's talking about you know the world seeks these things. He said, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? And these are the things that the world worries about. And and he's trying to differentiate between the world and and this new kingdom that he's introducing, uh, the kingdom of God. He says people are worried about what they're going to eat and where they're going to live and what are they going to wear and all these things that it consumes people. But then Jesus comes in and says, "But, but I say to you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his way of doing things, his kingdom, and, and God will take care of the rest of this stuff that, that, we ha- that we worry about in this life. He said, we've got to put God's kingdom first, and then he's going to take care of this, this side of earth, this, this, our physical life, that God will take care of those things in our life. And so what we see here is that we have to seek the kingdom of God, first and foremost. What does that mean? Is that we're not automatically a part of the kingdom of God. Not everybody on earth is a part of the kingdom of God, but it's a separate thing, all right? And it's something that we need to seek out, all right? We said that we enter the kingdom of God through, through, by grace, through faith, that we're saved. Yes, but once we are saved, once we are there to understand the kingdom of God, we need to, to seek what it is that His will in our life and that we need to seek what God wants us to do. We need to seek the scriptures to better understand God. And, and it, we're not automatically just in that mindset of the kingdom, but it, it, it has to be changed. Our thoughts have to be changed to kingdom thoughts because we live by worldly thoughts, don't we? We grew up you know, being taught all of this stuff about how the world works. And, and yes, that stuff is true, but God's kingdom is so much bigger and better than the, the, world, the world's kingdom. And so we have to change the way that we think in order to be a part of the kingdom of God and to fully experience it. And he said, seek it. Seek the kingdom of God. You're going to have to put in some work and some effort to figure it out because I'm not just going to put it on your plate so you can just understand it all right away. I wish God would do that. As soon as we got saved, we understood everything about God. Wouldn't that have been awesome? That we fully understood God and His will for our life and how everything works. And, but it doesn't work that way, does it? No, we got to put in some work and that we need to seek God. We need to seek God through His Word. We need to seek to experience God and His presence in our life. And so we must be purposeful in seeking the kingdom of God. We can jump over into Romans chapter 14. Verse 17, it says, The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
as we back up and look at what he was talking about here, uh, it, they were they're having this discussion like, you know, certain people uh, honor certain days of the week as holy. And some people say that you can eat this and you can't eat this. And, and, and you know, going back into a lot of the, uh, the Jewish law, you know, that ruled, ruled their lives, he said, listen, the kingdom of God is more about eating and drinking. It's more, it's more than just this physical stuff that we see. All right, the kingdom of God is not a physical thing that, that you can point to and say, there's the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not physical, but it, it's, it's in a different realm of its own. It's, it's beyond our realm. See, the kingdom of God is in heaven, and we're trying to bring it here to earth, right? That's, kind of, that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be revealing the kingdom of God here on earth. That's what we would call preaching the gospel or the message of the kingdom, is that it's our job to reveal that. And he says, we get caught up in all this physical stuff. It's like, well, you're supposed to worship on Sunday. No, you're supposed to do it on Saturday. No, you're supposed to do it here. You're supposed to worship on this mountain, or you're supposed to go to the temple, or you're supposed to do this. You can't eat this, and you can't. He said, listen, all that stuff, you're missing the point. All right? It's not about what you eat and what you drink, but it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. You know what all those things are right there? It's the things that you can only get from God. We cannot earn righteousness. We cannot produce peace. We cannot produce joy in our life. That only comes from God. So here we see again that we need to be seeking God and what He has for us in His kingdom. He said, the kingdom of God is not about all the physical stuff, but it's about what God can give you. All right, let me give you one more before we jump into the parables. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. This is the Lord's Prayer. And, and I love how what, what Jesus reveals in this. He said, this, is, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All right, and so what we, what we see here, he said that we need to pray for your kingdom to come. And your will to be done on earth. All right. So he's saying that the kingdom of God isn't naturally here on earth. He says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, God's will is done in heaven. In heaven is perfection. In heaven there is no sin. There is no evil. There is none of that out, out there in heaven. And so we're praying for, for his kingdom to come to earth. And for his will to be done on earth. Those things aren't naturally happening. But as we are active into the kingdom of God and that we're praying these things and we're, we're, being, uh, we're being the kingdom of God, then His kingdom is coming and His will is being done on earth. See, we're the answer to that prayer, right? <laughs> that, that we're supposed to be those things in this earth. See, we need to be active in the kingdom of God. That we need to be doing something, we need to be active, and we must submit our will to Him. Right? If His will is to be done on earth as it is in heaven, how is that done? It's by us submitting our will to Him. And that we live out His will here on this earth. Just as Jesus did, He submitted to the will of the Father. He said, I only say the things I hear the Father say. I only do the things the Father tells me to do. So I don't do anything on my own. And that needs to be our life as well as that... We don't need to be saying things outside of what God says. That we don't need to be doing things outside of what God wants us to do. And that's His will being done on earth as it is in heaven. And we need to be active in the kingdom of God by submitting to His will. All right, y'all still with me? Let's go to Matthew chapter 13. Let's look at some of the parables that He taught, that Jesus taught about the kingdom of God. And I love this. The first one, he doesn't specifically say the kingdom of God is like, but that is what we're talking about here in this. So Matthew chapter 13, I'm not going to read all of this. I'm going to read probably about 90% of it. Um, but we'll have to do it fast. We've got 22 minutes. Eight parables, 22 minutes. Someone do the math. Not enough time. That's right. That's the right math right there. All right, so let's go. Matthew chapter 13, verse 1, it says, That same day he went out of the house and sat by the lake. Uh, such a large crowd gathered around him that he got into the boat and he sat in it, which all people stood on the shore. First off, just a little side note, um, that we see that Jesus is purposely 
teaching this thing. This isn't something that someone asked him. This is not something that, that was within a conversation, but this is purposeful. Jesus sat down and he thought this out and he, he was like, this is what I want to talk about today. All right, and, and see, we see the posture of Jesus that he said he went and he sat by the lake. As we look into Jewish culture, when a rabbi went to teach, he would sit to teach. And so here we see him act, actively being in the, the office of rabbi here. And so he, he was purposely meaning to teach them something in this moment. Verse 3 says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he scattered the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and they ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plant. Still other seed fell on the good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When the disciples came to him and asked, Why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied to them, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Now, that, that's an interesting statement by Jesus, and we're not going to dive into that today. We don't have time. I want to talk about the parable that he did. But, but he's, he was speaking to the crowd about this parable. All right? and, he, and he speaks to them in terms that they understand. All right? This is an agricultural society. They understand crops. They understand uh, raising animals. This was a part of their life. And so he spoke to them in ways that they would understand. All right? Uh, but he didn't always tell them what it meant. All right? He kind of left it up to them to interpret what it meant. And so he goes on to explain this uh, down in verse 18. But before we do that, I want to jump over to Matthew chapter 4, or Mark chapter 4, because this is uh, Mark's uh, version of what Jesus said to him. And, and it's interesting what Mark recorded. He said, Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? then how will, will you understand any parable? What he's saying here is if you don't understand this one, you're not going to get the rest of them. And so this one's a foundational principle that you must understand. All right, And then he goes and he explains it to the disciples. And so here's what's happening. He's teaching to the crowd and the disciples kind of come to the side and like, Hey, Jesus, what are you talking about? And so he kind of has this sidebar with the disciples where he explains it to them. And this is what he says. Uh, verse 18 it says, listen, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. He said, anyone who hears the message of the kingdom. I want to stop right there just for a second. All right, I like how Mark records it over in his. He said, the farmer sows the word. All right, the farmer sows the word. He, he was a little bit more direct uh, in, in his interpretation of what Jesus said, is that the farmer is sowing the word of God. All right. In Matthew, he says, uh, when someone hears the message about the kingdom. Okay, those two things are the same thing. The message of the kingdom and God's word is the same thing. They're sowing God's word. They're sowing uh, what Jesus came to, to be here. They're sowing about the Messiah coming and coming to change people's lives. He said, the sower sows the word. It says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in their hearts. This is the seed sown along the path. Said so the seed falling along the rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, uh, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth chokes the word making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on the good soil uh, refers to somebody who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. All right, and so he has this moment where he's explaining this to his disciples. I wish I had time to go talk about each one of these, but we don't have that kind of time today. That'll be a, a, a different sermon maybe one day that we can talk about. But, but here we see uh, some things that we see about this is that um, the seed is sown without prejudice. 
When, when the farmer went out to sow, he sowed it on all the ground, didn't he? All right, He just didn't go to the good soil that he had been working and tilling and just sow it there. But he sowed it on the path. Did he know that the path would not produce anything? Yeah. I mean, if you could imagine going and, and uh, sowing the seed out on the, the highway out there, right? you're not going to expect much produce out of that, are you? No, there's some of it will fall in the cracks and there'll be some little things shoot up, but you're, there's not going to be much there. He went and he sowed among the, the thorns. He went and sowed among the rocks. He went and sowed on the good ground. See, the farmer sowed without prejudice of the ground. The kingdom of God is for everybody. All right? See, I believe that the kingdom of God is for everybody, that everybody has a chance... To hear the, the message of the kingdom and to respond to it. All right? I, that, that's the first thing I see in this parable is that, that the seed is sown without prejudice. He sowed it to everyone. The harvest depends on the condition of the person's heart who received it. All right? And so here's the first principle that we see about the kingdom of God that he is teaching is that, that the kingdom of God is for everybody. But not everybody's going to respond the same. Some people, the enemy's going to come and take that seed away from them, and they're not going to produce any of them. Some people, they're going to be like the rocky soil where there's not much there. They're going to hear the gospel, and they're going to be excited about it. We, we, we all know people like this. They're excited about it. You know, they're like, whoa, yeah. But then hard times come, and they fall away. And then there'll be people in, in this life that, that hear the gospel, and, and they'll receive it, and it'll begin to grow in their life. But the worldly things in their life, they never pluck those things out. And so that chokes out the kingdom of God in their life. But there's some people that's just soaking it in. Man, they're receiving that word, they're producing, and they continue to produce more and more and more throughout their lives. The kingdom of God is for everybody, but not everybody's going to receive it the same. Sometimes there's things in your life that's going to stop the kingdom of God from growing. That we need to, to pluck out those, those distractions in our life. And, and one, one thing that we got to be careful about on this one is that we don't try to put ourselves in there and say that this is me. All right? I don't think that he was given a list that you can only be one, two, three, or four. You can, you can't, you, you're only one. You can't be more than that. I believe that I've been all of these in my life. I've been in all of these places. Right now, I'm probably all of these things right now in different areas of my life. There's some places that I'm receiving from God and, and something's producing in my life, but there's some things that I still have some weeds in my life. I still have some of those worldly desires that's choking some things out in my life, and God's kingdom isn't producing fully in my life because of that. There's some places in my life I'm still a little shallow, and then I need to, to work some of those rocks out of my life as well. And so, uh, as what we see here is that the kingdom of God is for everybody, but not everybody's going to respond the same to it. But it's available to everybody. All right, he goes on to the next one. This is the, the parable of the weeds in verse 24. It says, Jesus told another parable. He's still talking to the crowd. He, he's, he's done with the sidebar with his disciples. He was, he's explained it. Now he's talking to the crowd again. <coughs> it said, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. He's sticking with the seed in the field and stuff. He says, but while, while they were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. And then he went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, the weeds also appeared. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you just sow good seed in the field? When did the weeds come from? Where did the weeds come from? And he said, the enemy did this. The servant asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he said, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both of them grow until harvest. At, the time, at that time, I will tell the harvesters to collect the weeds, tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into the barn. All right, and so he told this parable uh, to the crowd as well. All right, he didn't explain it, but later the disciples came and asked him, what did you mean by that one parable about the weeds? All right, and, and, and so he went and he explained it to them. This was a little bit later, and we'll come back to this here in a second, but I want to read the explanation to this. He, he breaks it down, makes it very simple, and says, the one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. He said, that's the Messiah, that's me, all right? 
He said, I'm the one who sowed the good seeds. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom of God. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Man, he just broke it down real simple for them, didn't he? He didn't leave anything to the imagination. And, and so what he's saying is like, the good seed is from God. The bad seed is from the devil. All right? The seed is the world. And so what we see here, this picture that he's, he's making here is that, that we're all in this world and there's good and evil all combined up, up in the world. All right? And, and I love the question that they asked. He says, do you want us to go get the weeds now? He said, no, let's wait till the end at harvest time and then you can pluck the weeds up so we don't mess up the, the wheat. But you can pluck the weeds up, we'll burn those, and then we'll harvest the wheat. What I see in this is God's grace. I see God's grace in this because here's the thing is that God could judge us at any moment. He has full right to judge humanity. And let me tell you something. We're guilty, right? And so what, he, what, what I feel like is being said here is that I don't want to prejudge people before the end of time. Because, you know, we all come to salvation at different times, don't we? Aren't you glad God didn't judge you while you were still in your sin? Aren't you glad that, that He was patient with you? See, He doesn't want anybody to perish, but all to come to repentance. And so he said, he said, I'm not slow as you think that I am slow, but I am being patient with people and giving them time to respond to the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not saying that, that weeds are going to turn to weed. I, I, I mean, that doesn't fit that parable. But what I'm saying is that I'm glad that He didn't judge me when I was still in my sin, pluck me out and burn me. But he gave me an opportunity to respond to the message of the kingdom. He said, we'll wait to the end and then we'll sort it all out. Is what he's saying here. It's like, let's wait and let's sort it all out at the end. He goes on in verse 40 and says, As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. That's good. So they will be thrown into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen to this. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Man, that is a great promise right there. That at some point, God is going to take all, all the sin and all the evil out of this world and that it will just be the righteous at that point. And it says the righteous will shine like the sun. And that is a great promise from God, is that one day we won't have to be dealing with sin and evil anymore. Amen. Yes, thank you, God. Okay, great. I love this tag. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. He said, if you're listening, I'm teaching you something. If you're listening. All right, so let's go on. Verse 31, let's go back to, he's still talking to the crowd here. Ooh, I've got eight minutes. I've covered two parables in eight minutes. Got eight minutes left. The rest of them are shorter, though. All right, so verse 31. Next page. He told them another parable. It said, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and he planted in, in the field. Though it was the smallest of seeds, yet it grows. It's the largest of the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds can come and perch in its branches. What is he meaning by this one? And, and, and this is what I think he's saying here is that the kingdom of God will start small. All right? It's going to start small, but it's going to grow into something mighty. Think about how the kingdom of God started. It started with 12 men, didn't it? Just think about on the day of Pentecost how many people were in the upper room when the Holy Spirit was poured out. That's where the kingdom of God came in full force in this earth and, and that salvation was available to everybody. And just think how quickly it grew into something mighty. If you look at Christianity today, what started in the upper room with just a handful of people now is the, the most influential uh, religion in the world. It's the biggest religion in the world right now. It was something small that started with a few people, but God grew it into something mighty. And, and, and it's a force to be reckoned with now. It's going to start small, 
but it's going to grow into something mighty. Verse 33, let's read the next one. He said, but the kingdom of God is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked throughout the whole dough. Has anybody ever worked 60 pounds of flour before? That seems like it would be a ridiculous job to me. I don't know. I've never done that before. I mean, we got mixers and stuff that do stuff like that now. But back in those days, I mean, they would like need that stuff in there. What it's talking about, if you, if you don't know anything about yeast, I'm not a baker. I don't know much about it, but I know that yeast makes things rise, right? It, it makes flour rise. And so he said that you just put a little bit of yeast in 60 pounds of flour, and it's got to be worked through the whole thing. See, eventually that yeast is going to affect the whole, isn't it? The whole thing. And so as I look at this, it said the kingdom of God will start small, but as it works into your life, it will permeate every aspect of your life. All right? I believe there's another level of this. As, as the kingdom of God is entering into the world, it will permeate all throughout the world. Just think about, look at different societies throughout history about how they might have started off as as a pagan thing, but the kingdom of God enters in and it changes into something to where all of a sudden Christianity is uh, the national religion uh, of it. You know, we used to say America was a Christian country. I don't believe that's so much true anymore. Um, our, our government is not based on Christianity necessarily, but just think about how much Christianity has permeated throughout our entire country. All right. At one time, I mean, it was just a given that, that you went to church on Sunday. I mean, that, that's been a few years ago, right? Uh, that's definitely changing at this point. But, but the kingdom of God is going to start small, but it will grow and it will, it, it will produce things. It will uh, permeate all throughout your life and throughout society as well. All right, and so at this point, we see a little change. In verse 36, he said, Then he left the crowd and he went into the house and his disciples came to him. All right, and so now we see a change. We see four parables he spoke to the crowd. Now he's going to give four parables just to his disciples now. All right, and so there's a change of thing, and so he's going to uh, give a little bit different, deeper aspect of the kingdom of God. Verse 44 <clears throat> said, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then... Uh, Ooh, my mind just went blank. He found it and hid it, and, <laughs> and he hid it again. Then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had and bought the field. <clears throat> Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. Here we see these two parables. They seem like they're saying the same thing, and, and they basically are, but I see a little bit different in this. <clears throat> the first one we see a man that he found a treasure in a field. Now, if, if we think about this parable a second, this is not his field. All right, so he's trespassing on someone's property, right? This is what's happening here. Uh, and so he finds, he comes across a treasure in a field. We don't know if he was looking for treasure. We don't know if, if he was purposely trying to find something there, but he came across a treasure. All right, he found it and he's like, ooh, this is valuable. And so he hid it. Then he went and sold everything that he had so that he could find, so that he can go and buy that treasure. All right, so he found the kingdom of God and he recognized its value and then he sold out to God. He went all in on the kingdom of God. This reminds me of a story uh, in the Gospels uh, in John chapter 4. We call this the woman at the well or the Samaritan woman, where Jesus and his disciples were. We're um, going across Samaria, and they stop at this well. It's midday, it's hot, they're hungry, and so they stop at this well. He sends the disciples into town to buy some food, and a Samaritan woman comes out uh, to draw water. And, and uh, I wish I had time to talk about it all, but, but he basically asked the woman for water, and there's this whole conversation about, why are you talking to me? And Jesus said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. He's about ready to share the message of the kingdom with this woman, all right? And so what we see here is that this woman, she wasn't coming to seek anything, was she? She's coming to get water, all right? And she happened to cross Jesus who was offering the kingdom of God to her, all right? And so they have this little back and forth, and then he says, why don't you go get your husband, all right? And she said, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right, you've had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. 
uh-oh. She says, I perceive that you're a prophet, sir. <laughs> and, and so this conversation goes on to where Jesus reveals himself to her that he is the Messiah, the one that they've been watching for. And so she runs back into the village and tells everybody, he's like, listen, I found the one. I found the Messiah. Come and hear for yourself. All right. And so here we see a woman who come out to get some water. She happened upon the kingdom of God and saw the value of it. And she went and she told everybody. And, and Jesus ended up staying there several days preaching the message of the kingdom to the village. All right. And so that's what kind of reminds me of this one is that she wasn't looking for the kingdom of God. She was obviously looking for somebody. She's on her sixth man. Right. She was searching for something and she wasn't finding it until she came across Jesus. She happened upon the kingdom of God, saw its value, and she went all in. As we look at the other parable about the, the pearl, it's a little bit different. See, I believe that the merchant was searching with purpose. He was looking for a pearl. He was looking. He, he knew what he was looking for. In fact, I, I would imagine that he came across several pearls that he didn't figure that was worth that much. But when he found this pearl, he said, this is the one. And he said that he went and sold everything to buy that pearl. And so here we see someone purposely seeking the pearl. And when he found it, he knew its value. It, it reminds me of a story that we see in Acts chapter 8. And it's the Ethiopian eunuch. What was happening here is that this eunuch, he was riding in his chariot. He was going from Jerusalem back to uh, Ethiopia. And he's reading Isaiah. All right, he's searching the scripture. And God sent Philip uh, to go and talk to him about that. I'm sure this was an interesting scene. He's riding in a chariot and Philip is like, comes up next to him. So in my mind, this chariot, this horse is running and Philip's like running next to him. Like, hey. And he hears him reading Isaiah. Never mind. <laughs> and they see him reading Isaiah. And he said, do you understand what you're reading? He said, no. How could we understand unless someone teaches us? And Philip sits down and he teaches him. He shares the message of the kingdom to this eunuch. All right? and, and this eunuch accepts the message, and he said, what would stop me from getting baptized in that water right there? I, I mean, he was all in, man. He heard the message of the kingdom, and he's like, yes, this is it. I want to be baptized right now. And so Philip gets in the water, and they baptize him, and he gets out, and God just takes Philip away. He goes somewhere else in that moment. And so here what we see is that... that this eunuch was searching the scripture. He was looking. He was seeking to understand. And God revealed the message of the kingdom to him. And he sold out. He was all in on the kingdom of God. So what I'm seeing here is that it doesn't matter if you're looking or if you're not looking. When you come across the message of the kingdom of God and it changes your life, you need to go all in on it. You don't need to be going halfway. You don't need to just come to church on Sunday and just say, I did my Christian thing. But no, let's go all in on this thing. If you understand the value of the kingdom of God, you will go all in. If you don't see the value in it, you won't. All right. Two more. Ooh, I'm out of time. All right, here we go. Verse 47. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up to the shore, and then they sat down and collected all the good fish into baskets and all the bad they threw away. This is how it will be in the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understand all of these things? Jesus asked them. And so here, this is very similar to the parable of the weeds to where we see that all of the fish are intermingled together. And it says, at the end, we will be separated, the good and the bad. And the bad will be thrown out where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so uh, what we see here, uh, it reminds me of in Matthew chapter 4, verse 19, when Jesus is calling Peter and Andrew, what did he say? He said, I will make you fisher of men. All right, and that was just, just a little connection there. All right, one more. Verse 52, therefore anyone, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasure and old as well. All right, and so here's the last one that he spoke uh, with, within this thing of, um, of the parables. 
He said, therefore, every teacher, all right, he's speaking specifically about people who are going to be teaching about the kingdom of God, all right, and they've become disciples uh, in the kingdom of God. He's like an owner of a house who brings out his, of a storeroom, new treasure as well as old. As we look throughout scripture, we see treasure, uh, it, it, it equals wisdom. We, we see this all throughout, uh, especially in Proverbs, where, where he talks about the treasure being wisdom or, or the knowledge of God. It, it's not just knowing, but it's applying it to our lives and it's, and it's affecting our lives. And, and, and so that he, sees, he says, when you guys are teaching, all right, all of the wisdom that you have, you're going to be talking about the new teachings that Jesus is telling you about the kingdom of God. But listen, you're going to have to rely on the old wisdom as well. He's saying the the Old Testament is still valid. All right, You're going to need to draw on what you already know, not just the new things that you're learning, but the old things, and they're all going to mesh together, and they're all going to be teaching the kingdom of God. How many times do we see the disciples go into the Old Testament to quote things to prove the kingdom of God to people? It happens time and time and time again. And so he's not saying, I'm doing away with all the old stuff. He said, but you've got lots of wisdom from the old. He says, let's combine that with the new, and this is what the kingdom of God is going to be in the how we reveal to this. And so what do we see? What do we see in the message of what he's talking about in the kingdom of God? As we go back to the very beginning, the word, the message of the kingdom of God is a seed, and that's where it all begins. See, nobody's life changes without the seed of the message. We must hear the gospel in order for our lives to change, for us to give our lives to Jesus. It all starts with the message. That's why it's so important that we're preaching the gospel, that we're sharing the message of the kingdom. God wants all to hear the message. We see in Matthew 24, 14, it says, And the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. See, it's God's will for everybody to hear the message of the kingdom. What it produces is dependent on the condition of the receiver's heart. We see that God sows the good seeds. And there's an enemy out there that's sowing bad seeds. They will coexist until the end. They will coexist until harvest time and God will sort out the good and the bad. The kingdom of God will start small, but it will grow into something Mighty. The kingdom of God needs to permeate our whole lives in order to grow within us. We see that the kingdom of God is worth searching for. Some will find it accidentally. Others will find it on purposely, but both are equal. You'll be sharing the message of the kingdom. Use the new teachings along with the old wisdom to proclaim the kingdom of God. See, I, I, I love this idea of the kingdom of God and that, that Jesus taught it so, it so much. And that the kingdom of God is what we need to be living in. We don't need to look at this world and think, how can I make more money? How can I do this? No, what can I do to glorify God? What can I do to point people to Jesus in my life? When we're doing that, we're being active in the kingdom of God. Let's pray today. Dear God, we pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. May your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. We ask for your peace. We ask for your justice to reign in our world. We pray for the end of poverty, suffering, disease. May your love and mercy be shared with all people all throughout the world. And may your light shine bright in the darkness. We pray for your guidance and your wisdom for all leaders, that they may seek to serve and to protect the people under their care. We pray for strength and courage for those who are facing hardships and struggles. May they find hope and comfort in you. We pray for unity and harmony among all people, that we may come together as brothers and sisters, children of the same loving God. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we get to our feet?